Hello and welcome back to the channel. I recently made a video describing my 10 favorite Penguin classics. Today I decided to do something a little similar, although these are not favorite books of mine. These are just books that I really admire, that I've learned a lot from, and that is why there are 10 essential Penguin classics that I can't live without. And you know, if I had to contract my library enormously, these are 10 Penguin classics that I could not do without. So yeah, let's dive into them. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. This is not one of my favorite novels of all time, but I have it in various editions. And it is just a masterpiece of exposing the folly of human overreaching, the, the hubris, the desire to be gods, the desire to use our technology, to play with the, the very fabric of life and to create um, monsters through the violence done to other beings, right? So Frankenstein's monster is constructed out of the flesh of, of, of other beings. And there is uh, an implicit sense of death woven into that. Um, these bodies, these bones from the charnel houses Mary Shelley has an astounding gift for employing empathy in the most unlikely form of otherness. This monster, this grotesque beast that is so unnatural, but yet made from natural substances. We feel empathy. We feel his suffering so deeply. And I think that she was definitely inspired by John Milton. And there's definitely some interesting parallels between Frankenstein's monster and the figure of Satan in Milton's Paradise Lost. And uh, Satan is also a, a flawed monster that is created. He was first an angel, right? So he was also created out of supposedly good intentions. And yet he's full of suffering and violence and darkness. And so that's, uh, she really teases out these, these, these grander, darker, deeper questions through this story. And yeah, you know, when you know the story of Mary Shelley's life, how much personal suffering she had, the death of two of her children, um, you really can understand like how this book is laced with pain. It is so deeply rife with, with pain and suffering on the most agonizing level. Yeah, it's a, it's a masterpiece. James Baldwin's Go Tell It on the Mountain. Now, this was Baldwin's first novel. And it is a fictionalized account of his experience growing up in a, in a very severely religious family and the Orthodox church community that they were a part of. There was a huge amount of pressure on black Americans to accept this false idea of the American dream as if it was some kind of gospel truth um, and to be obedient, submissive, citizens and subjects while at the same time dealing with uh, a huge amount of racial prejudice on the level of um, laws and government institutions they were massively disadvantaged and there was a huge prejudice against them and many of these black uh, families were, were very deeply religious uh, which you know it's easy for for us in hindsight to look back and say, well, that just seems weird that they would worship this, you know, this white God, this white Jesus that had been a part of the sort of manifest destiny of the American colonizing enterprise. But yeah, it was a, it was a sort of hope for them to cling on to in very dark and desperate times. And it gave their life a sense of meaning and the parents, especially uh, of this families and Baldwin's parents are a representative example were really terrified uh, for their children, understandably. And so they were very, very strict in their sort of probity and their rigid adherence to this kind of very sterilized, circumspect life. And their church community, their church life was very closely bound up with this. And that is what Baldwin writes about here. It's the story of a young boy whose father is a preacher and who lives in a segregated New York neighborhood 
and his, his life is full of peril and danger and his father is ex extremely harsh and demanding and he is this kid that just doesn't really fit in and he's trying to make sense of the brutality and the severity of this life that he leads and uh, he's trying to understand this God of love but yet he is living in this very um, unforgiving unfair world and he's trying to he's trying to make sense of these things from a, a child's sort of perspective of pure unideological perspective like hey this is not fair i don't see love i don't see justice i don't see fairness like why should i worship this supposedly white god and he does an incredible job of using that child's vantage point that child's perspective to illumine the the travesty of the injustice of the system and to show how one's search for meaning in the world can 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 use that religious context as a starting point and then project away from that into a more humanistic and sort of rational and more radical kind of empathy that does not rely on sacrosanct commonplace beliefs but rather seeks an independence of mind and spirit and it's painful it's very yeah circumscribed and um, bounded and pressurized and cramped this is baldwin as the fictionalized character of johnny grimes johnny is grappling with his guilt about his his awakening sexual feelings and his doubt about this yeah the system and it's so so excellently um, conveyed and evoked and it was a very powerful starting point for Baldwin's career. Next we've got Oscar Wilde, The Importance of Being Earnest and Other Plays. This is not actually the entire collected plays of Oscar Wilde but it's um, most of the major plays. We have got Lady Windermere's Fan, Salome, A Woman of No Importance, An Ideal Husband, a Florentine tragedy and of course the importance of being earnest and um, there's also a, a really thorough introduction and footnotes and yeah Oscar Wilde was another person I suppose who was grappling with the status quo as somebody whose sense of identity as an Irishman but also as um, as a homosexual in the 19th century was he was derided he was oppressed for for being who he was and he had to live in this kind of um, secret dangerous illicit um, state of being which was just yeah of course massively evil that that he would have to hide his true self and he used his plays as very scathing satirical vehicles in which to criticize the the uppish the the, the english upper classes he did that he did, he did that with such deft and subtlety that his audiences were actually the sort of target group that he was criticizing and they were brought into these settings of the plays of these kind of landed gentry and aristoc aristocratic vapid um, lords and ladies and he would subtly build up this farce in which their idiocy and hypocrisies of their lifestyle and their ideas and their um, their social codes he sort of builds up this expose of the absurdity and injustice of it brilliantly um, and like all good art it's not just propaganda and the same can be said for Baldwin's I go to lot on the mountain it is not just railing against uh, you know Christian hypocrisy in go to lot on the mountain and Wild is not just um, sort of uh, de deriding upper English class values in his plays. They are they're always um, injected with ambivalence and ambiguity, and there is always a sense of desire for yeah these luxuries and these kind of unbounded personal and, uh, and, and and economic freedoms and wild wild's life was this strange paradox because he did enjoy the good things in life he, he did have a lavish lifestyle and 
a lot of his good friends, a lot of the people that he dedicates the place to were aristocrats. So he's kind of got this one foot in, one foot out of the door perspective. But that is what allows it to be good art and not just propaganda because they're not just archetypes, especially the better plays, um, such as uh, The Importance of Being Earnest or Lady Wyndham is Fan. They are... Um, a woman of no importance as well. They're, they're not just archetypal figures. They are um, complex, contradictory, uh, fizzing, sparkling, uh, shadowy figures that um, are representative of the complexities of the world we live in, in which it's not just good and bad. You know, life is complex and we're all flawed and good art uh, conveys that in a very succinct way. Next, I've got Herman Melville's Moby Dick. Now, this book is, is, is a panoramic, expansive, garrulous, messy, loose baggy monster. Um, and it couldn't be a slim novella. It has to be a big, chunky, stormy, unraveling world unto itself because that is the subject of this book and the form must fit the subject. And... The subject is ostensibly whaling and the search for the white whale, also known as Moby Dick. Um, but it is really about so much more. And um, I include this book here as a Penguin classic that is an essential for me because it encompasses so much of what novel writing at its highest form is about. It is an encyclopedic panorama of human experience and history and scientific registers and byways and highways of literary and scientific discourse and also an incredible voyage and a very Shakespearean rhetorically rich epic. Next, a very different scale, I've got Virginia Woolf's Flush. This is a, a very slim and delicious and playful biography of Elizabeth Barrett Browning's pet dog, Flush. Elizabeth Barrett Browning, of course, was a poet. Her and her partner, Robert Browning, were this like literary power couple. And this is Virginia Woolf's biography of her pet dog. And you might think, well, that seems a bit silly or a bit light or a bit a bit facetious even like why not just write about elizabeth barrett browning but we actually do learn a lot about the character of barrett browning through the sketches that make up this book and um it was done obviously a little bit tongue-in-cheek but it's also very tender and, and and beautiful and funny and it's like an old friend uh that that one can return to and i, I don't think i could do without my copy of flush Next, I've got Vladimir Nabokov's Nikolai Gogol in this modern classics. Uh, why did I include this? Again, it's not my favorite Nabokov. It's not my favorite. It's not, it's not probably in my sort of top 50 favorite books of all time. But this is just a stunning example of literary criticism of biography. Interesting to have these two kind of in juxtaposition. Um, this is, is a serious work, but Nabokov... He really lives and breathes his subject of Gogol. And you can see that he has read and reread everything that Gogol wrote, um, you know, over and over again and absorbed it into his bloodstream and then imbued the pages of this book with such a, a deep and empathetic and generous, but also critical and sharply observant exegesis of of Gogol's work and um, of his character and it's just a, a shining stunning example of literary biography uh, on, on, on the highest level. Next I've got my Penguin Classics uh, Beowulf. This is the Michael Alexander translation. I, I was sort of thinking that I wanted to pick one epic uh, for this video of, of these Penguin Classics essentials and I was kind of contemplating Homer or, or Milton but instead, I just went for Beowulf because I feel a sort of kinship to the, the Anglo-Saxon roots of this poem. Um, of course, Homer and Milton are, are part of that. Milton, obviously, more recent than, than either Beowulf or 
Homer, but um, yeah, I just, I, I, this is such a key work and um, I really enjoy this translation and it's a really, really fantastic introduction as well, written by Michael Alexander himself. And Beowulf is this mythical epic of the hero Beowulf, the eponymous hero Beowulf, and he, his uh, battle with the monster Grendel and slaying Grendel and Grendel's mother. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a Scandinavian hero. It's kind of folkloric, epic. Uh, it's an oral, comes out of an oral tradition, but the composition of this was, com was completed in England in the 8th century BC by scholars, by, by Christian, early Christian scholars who tried to overlay uh, this text with Christian values. And it's, it's an interesting kind of disjunctive feeling in parts of this book. Uh, it's almost like a palimpsest uh, with the, with the, these Christian overtones and the the, the Germanic, Anglo-Saxon, Scandinavian, pagan undercurrents that really underpin this work. But uh, it's it's very influential. It's it's very old and very. Um, it's got a kind of war drum feel in its alliterative thrumming and humming and um, pounding of of the lines as they unfold and uh, had to include it okay i've got three more i'm going to go through them a little quicker uh truman capote in cold blood uh now yeah this is not my favorite truman capote work but it is a masterpiece and this was the original true crime work of literature uh, he takes stories of a real gruesome uh devastating horrifying murder um but he he doesn't just it's not just reportage it's not just a, a news article extended into a book uh there is a rich vivid lucid enthralling psychological depth to this book uh in the way that it unfolds the the characters involved and and the 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 psyches of the of the two murderers and um yeah it's 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 a it's a landmark it's a cornerstone it's an it's an originator of, of a whole genre of, of, of popular um, books and 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 TV series and uh, had to include it. Okay, last two. Jane Austen's Persuasion. Well, it's hard to pick one, but I had to include one Austen, and I decided to include Persuasion because I, I absolutely can't live without this book. Uh, yet it's not uh, probably not my favourite. Uh, although it comes close to being a favorite, as, as any of these books do, um, if not closer. Persuasion by Jane Austen. This book, I think, is um, it's her shortest novel. Uh, it was published posthumously, so after, just after she died in 1818. Yeah, just published in 1818, just, just after she had died. It's the story of Anne Elliot, probably the most lovable um, Austin heroine and you want to champion her and she always puts other people first um, but the the tension is ratcheted up as the novel unfolds and you, it's, it's honestly a page turner you, you can't put it down it's it's so magnetizing and gorgeously woven it's a gorgeously woven tapestry of social codes and um, psychological insights and interpersonal conflicts and tensions that is just um, kind of swirled together into a stunning, stunning uh, finale of, of, of love and destiny. And it's so gorgeous, so I had to include it. All right, lastly, uh, we've got Plato, the Symposium. Um, Plato is not my favorite philosopher by any stretch of the imagination. And I sort of, I could have included a different Plato. It didn't have to be the Symposium. But I included it because of the incredible learning that you gain from reading Plato. Um, and this is because he writes in with this technique of the Socratic dialogue. So Socrates is, is the mouthpiece of Plato. You know, generally Socrates is seen as this kind of originary uh, genius philosopher. And Plato was his uh, disciple, was his student, who then afterwards wrote it all down. But I don't know. I mean... Yeah, uh, Plato clearly was a genius himself in, in his ability to transcribe and, and, and transfer these ideas into such seamless and dynamic, concise literary form. 
and these dialogues, you don't have to agree like with what is being said. Uh, I don't believe, for example, to take the, the, the symposium, I don't believe that every soul is split in two and these two half circles are floating around the universe and at some point, you know, um, the, the, you find your soulmate and it's the two circles are joined together into a sense of unity. But it's the way that the arguments are um, brought into focus and then deconstructed and then reassembled and it's just a very important life skill to be able to think clearly through arguments and you should argue with this book as you go along through it so it's just a it's a really useful text in order to to think through the to, to think through ideas using the socratic method of asking questions of every idea and, and and finding the underlying assumptions and the sort of ideological underpinnings of of any proposition of any idea of any argument of any statement of any thesis and unpicking them in order to get to uh, the, 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 the the sort of unstated or even unconscious beliefs or values or conceptions that lie underneath and through doing that to get as close to some kind of truth uh, as we can through rational discourse so that was my 10 essential penguin classics i couldn't really do without these in my library if i had to if i had to uh pare my library down if i had to uh shave off 90 percent of it i think that these 10 books would uh would have to stay at the, at the very core of my collection so what are your essential penguin classics um which books can you from this publisher can you not live without would love to uh to hear if any of these are your essentials did I get anything wrong? Could I have explained something better? Please tell me in the comments below. We don't have to agree about, about everything, but yeah, just do it kindly and respectfully and we're good to go. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks so much and uh, until next time.